the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from The Sufis by Idris Shah. This audio has been made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. The Higher Law There are three indications of real generosity. To remain steadfast without resisting, to praise without the emotion of generosity, and to give before being asked. Maruf Khaki One of the most interesting productions of Western Sufic literature is the long poem The Qasidah, written a century ago by the explorer Sir Richard Burton, himself a Sufi, and composed on his return journey from Mecca. This Lay of the Higher Law, which appeared in small editions, aroused a great deal of interest. Even Lady Burton, who was not over-sympathetic to her husband's heterodox beliefs, confessed that she had read it many times and, never without bitter tears, and when I read it now it affects me still more. He used to take it away from me because it impressed me so. There is no doubt that the poem is a powerful composition, steeped in Sufi lore. Burton, in his foreword to The Qasida, called himself the translator, and attributed the work to one Haji Abdu al-Yazdi. He summarizes it thus. The principles which justify the name Higher Law are as follows. The author asserts that happiness and misery are equally divided and distributed in the world. He makes self-cultivation with due regard to others the sole and sufficient object of human life. He suggests that the affections, the sympathies and the divine gift of pity are man's highest enjoyments. He advocates a suspension of judgment with a proper suspicion of facts, the idlest of superstitions. Finally, although destructive to appearance, he is essentially reconstructive. Only an admirer of Omar Khayyam could have written the Qasida, says Justin Huntley McCarthy. And yet, according to Lady Burton, the poem was written eight years before Fitzgerald introduced Burton, Swinburne and Rossetti to Omar. What the two poets have in common, of course, is that they are both Sufis. Although only a few hundred copies appeared, the Qasida, the tinkling of the camel bell, was included in Lady Burton's biography of the greatest Oriental scholar England ever had and neglected. As a result, the work became very widely known, and its hidden influence upon those who studied it must have been great. Summing it up, Isabel Burton shows how the outlines of Sufic thinking can influence even one who is devoutly Christian and unsympathetic to the author's commitment. It is a poem of extraordinary power on the nature and destiny of man, anti-Christian and pantheistic. So much wealth of Oriental learning has rarely been compressed into so small a compass. What Burton has done has been to comment in verse upon Western methods of thought, modern theories and philosophies, from the Sufi point of view. More, he has, like Khayyam, taken it upon himself to ask questions to which he does not supply fixed answers. This is the technique of the teaching Sufi who poses questions and waits to see whether his hearers will seek the explanation or not. The Sufi message had something for Western thinkers and was even recognised as the essence of Burton's life. Burton's life was described thus by one enthusiast. To me, its great raison d'etre is that tinkling of the camel bell. It is hard to judge of a thing in the first heat of admiration, 
but it seems to me worthy to stand level with the greatest poems of the earth and in front of most. It is a long poem, in twenty pages of type, and an author's commentary upon the supposed Haji upon whom he fathered it is even longer. Burton follows in his notes the method of Sufi teachers, and this is the part of the work which most clearly shows that he has been through a course of Sufic study under a master. There seems little doubt that Burton was trying to project Sufi teaching in the West. To this extent he must be considered a part of the process which has been continuous, the interchange between the East and West which is studied in this book. In Sufism he finds a system of application to misguided human faiths, which will prove them all right and all wrong, which will reconcile their differences, will unite past creeds, will account for the present, and will anticipate the future with a continuous and uninterrupted development. This is to be, by a process, not negative and distinctive, but on the contrary, intensely positive and constructive. Like all Sufis, he often uses the method of approaching his subject from a number of different angles, and then breaking away, leaving the reader to complete the process. The reason for this is that a Sufi is only made by passing through both discipleship and self-work, a Malinafs. Above all, Burton, writing in a time when science and reason were in the full flow of their ecstatic self-discovery, insists that there are things which human reason or instinct matured in its undeveloped state cannot master, but reason is a law to itself. Therefore we are not bound to believe or to attempt belief in anything which is contrary or contradictory to reason. The Kasada opens with the desert, the dark, the pilgrims on their way to Mecca. The hour is nigh, the waning queen walks forth to rule the later night, crowned with the sparkle of a star and throned on orb of ashen light. The night passes, while the travellers experience various emotions and Burton takes leave of the pilgrim caravan, the undeveloped human continuity. He is following another road, a Sufi way. Friends of my youth, at last adieu. Haply some day we meet again. Yet ne'er the selfsame men shall meet, the years shall make us other men. Go, vanish from my life as dies the tinkling of the camel's bell. Now the poem speaks of the endless questions which mankind asks, the dreadful fears which beset him. He quotes the Sufis Hafiz, the bard of love and wine, and Khayyam, who would divorce old barren reason from his bed and wed the vine-maid in her stead. Taking his questioning a stage further in typical Sufi style, he shows that there is something still deeper beyond their imagery. Fools who believe a word he said. He quotes the Sufi who says that anyone who knows that he has a soul is entitled to ask questions about it and he shows that the seeming pessimism of the Sufi at times hides something else, exposing the absurdity of selfishness. And this for all, for this we're born to weep a little and to die, so sings the shallow bard whose life still labours at the letter I. The Sufi insistence carries Burton onto Jesus. He bewailed our sorrows and our sin, why was a little glimpse of paradise not offered to man? Why could ears never hear and eyes never see bliss in the heavenly kingdom? Mansur, the Sufi martyr who was publicly disembodied by the forces of tyranny, is now put into juxtaposition with Jesus and quoted, I am the truth, I am the truth, the microcosm abides in me. Mansur was wise, but wise are they who smote him with the hurled stones. To eat, drink and make merry is something which may sound all very well, 
but it does not show any distinction between man and swine. The ascetic, fanatic that he is, answers Burton as he stalks the earth that he is completely confident in a life to come, adjusted to his veil of tears. Wiser is he than Moses, who ignored future rewards and punishments, who shows the future state, the future when he does not know the past, and to whom the present is a mere dream. Our Sufi does not like him at all. What knowst thou, man, of life, and yet for ever twixt the womb, the grave, thou pratest of the coming life, of heaven and hell thou fain must raise? The feeling of one's own importance, while according to the Sufi, it may be necessary in some ways, has to be moved into correct perspective, otherwise the human being becomes useless, though he may not seem so to other useless people. The world is old and thou art young, the world is large and thou art small, cease, atom of a moment's span, to hold thyself an all in all. The section which follows this admonition studies the contradictions of human speculation about life, and especially the theme of sorrow which runs through it. Illustrations are taken from Hinduism, Buddhism, the ancient Egyptians. The creator is seen as an enlarged human being, a potter, weaver, playing with what is only human sentiment. The way in which deity works, or seems to plan, is not explicable in human terms. Cease, man, to mourn, to weep, to wail, enjoy the shining hour of sun. We dance along death's icy brink, but is the dance less full of fun? Selecting sayings from ancient teachers, the English Sufi shows that the mere experience of life teaches nothing. Buddha and Confucius are quoted, and the man-made God is again attacked. Now the lowly ascetic, the religionist who merely affirms that he chooses to call the maker God, is assailed by the Sufi drawer of the wine. A changeful, finite creature cannot fathom the infinite depths of power with a foot of twine. The Sufic echo is treading close to the agnosticism of which the Sufis have sometimes been accused. It is only here in this narrow strip between faith and disbelief, that the truth is to be found. The childish fears of lost humanity seek a sure God, make him in their own image, then pray the law its laws to break. In one form or another we find the gloomy Brahman in India, the Chaldean star oracle, the Zoroastrian dualist, the Jewish Jehovah, Adon or Elohim, the god that smites the man of war. He sweeps past the gods of Greece, fair and frail humanities, to the Odin of the north. Looking at religion as a developing human movement, Burton watches the death of great Pan. The Nazarene comes and seizes his seat beneath the sun. The votary of the riddle god, whose one is three and three is one. The riddle refers to the Sufi use of three-letter roots. The three is one stands for the three letters A, H, D, together spelling the word unity. And, of course, the miserable creed of inherited sin. After Christianity, Islam. The lank Arab, a lizard-eater, overwhelms the lands of the grail of Jamshid. The Persians' idyllic traditions of old are gone. These are the ways of organized religions. They rose, they reigned, they fought and fell, as swells and swoons across the world the tinkling of the camel's bell. There is no good, no bad, as it is measured by ordinary standards. This Burton affirms without the usual Sufic rider that just what this means is experienced only in the Sufi's inner consciousness. As soon as it is expressed in the limited frame of words, it sounds destructive. But he is writing in the grip of Sufic exhilaration, 
and he is now addressing himself to Sufis alone. Good, he points out, is to man what he likes, evil what does him harm. These ideas change with location, with race and time. Every vice has been a virtue, every good has been called a sin or crime. Good and evil intertwine. Only Hida, the completed Sufi, can see where one begins and the other ends. The literalist, who claims that man's early state was the ideal one, is now brought under heavy fire. Burton takes his ammunition from the modern knowledge of evolution. Before man walked the earth, torture and suffering were the continuous tone. Primitive animals tore each other apart. Before that, the fair earth was alternately burning hot and frozen solid, the sun an orb of whirling fire, the moon a mere corpse of what had been a world. Early man was anything but refined. His choicest garb a shaggy fell, his choicest tool a flake of stone, his best of ornaments tattooed skin and holes to hang his bits of bone, who fought for female as for food when May awoke a warm desire, and such the lust that grew to love when fancy lent a purer fire. This primitive man learned from beavers and ants how to build, and it was when he mastered fire that the lord of beasts became a lord of men. Conscience was born when man had shed his fur, his tail, his pointed ears. The heritage of animality is still in man, and it is to be seen in the behaviour of one toward another. In defiance of his known history, Man cannot accept an explanation of himself based upon literal belief in tales and fables. Then, if tradition is not true, what is truth? What we think is truth is not such at all. This kind of truth is temperamental, changing. Burton explains this in his commentary upon Haji's poem, The perceptions, when they perceive truly, convey objective truth, which is universal whereas the reflectives and the sentiments, the working of the moral region or the middle lobe of the phrenologists, supply only subjective truth, personal and individual. Objective truth is the goal of the Sufi, and it is obviously toward the need for finding this that Burton is directing his audience. All mere theories, repetitious observances, are nothing. Burton now shouts at the priest to baptise the dead, as the Marcionites did, following a quotation from Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 29. Else what shall they do which are baptised for the dead, if the dead do not rise at all? Why are they then baptised for the dead? Truth cannot be found by the means which are generally used to seek it. Yes, truth may be, but tis not here. Mankind must seek and find it there. But where not I nor you can tell, nor aught earth mother ever bear. The struggle to find truth comes partly in its real form through not struggling at all. This is the Sufi paradox which is contained in the next lines. Enough to think that truth can be, come sit we where the roses glow. Indeed he knows not how to know, who knows not also how to unknow. Even the meaning of faith itself has to be approached by the Sufi in what seems to the ordinary person an elliptical manner. Like the masters before him, Burton approaches this by seeming paradox. All faith, he says, is both false and true. Truth is the shattered mirror strown in myriad bits, while each believes his little bit the whole to own. The kind of faith which unregenerate man takes for real faith is so often unmoved and fixed because it is merely what today would be called a conditioning. 
this false faith stands. And why? Because man's silly fancies still remain, and will remain till wiser man the daydreams of his youth disdain. This is precisely the thought of Rumi, when he asks when the hearer will stop coveting the sweets of childhood. Now into the discussion. After Burton dismisses the conventional teaching on the soul, the zealot strikes back with a harsh condemnation of materialism, which is what he thinks the Sufi is advocating. Tush, quoth the Zahid, or devotee, while we can the teaching of the school abhorred, that maketh man automaton, mind a secretion, soul a word. Burton spares him little time. Faith is due to an accident of birth, the faith that men normally know is a product of their environment. The author again pits one religionist against another, the Hindu despising the Frank, the Muslim crying about polytheism, the Buddhist calling the Confucian a dog, the Tata claiming that attention to a future state is betraying the efficiency and duties of man in the world. And the Sufi chimes in, you are all right, you are all wrong, we hear the careless Sufi say, for each believes his glimmering lamp to be the gorgeous light of day. Man's ignorance of his own ignorance is the real enemy. He must seek truth in the right way, must gladden the heart, abjure the why and seek the how. Looking to the future, because he finds no response in the people of his own time, Burton tells himself that, having delivered his message, in days to come when wisdom dwells with men, the echoes of a voice long stilled haply shall wake responsive strain. Wend now thy way with brow serene, fear not thy humble tale to tell, the whispers of the desert wind, the tinkling of the camel's bell. Burton's burst of Sufi activity in the Kasada, published 60 years ago, was paralleled by Wilberforce Clark's translation and adaptation of The Gifts. This cleared a great deal of ground in showing that the dervish philosophy was different from normal Western assessment of it at the time. This supplied at least a basis for the further examination of Sufic ideas, if not practices. Burton, by relating Sufi thought to modern Western feelings, provided a bridge whereby the thinking Westerner could accept essential Sufi concepts. It remained for Cartwright to leave an equally important book, one which, in the guise of pseudo-Oriental romance, presented some of the actual experiences of being a Sufi. Since the complete work and thought system of Sufism has not been much used in the West, and because of prejudice or a difference of thought, until recently seemed unlikely to naturalise itself where it was needed most, it is to be expected that few original literary works of a Sufi nature would be found in Western European languages. The textbooks in the East are generally couched in poetic or devotional terms, and the active part of the teaching is supplied by a master, whose major function is actually to be a master, to exist among his students. Cartwright did the next best thing. He wrote an account of his experiences in such a school. The Mystic Rose from the Garden of the King first appeared in 1899. Superficially, the book looks like a fantasy. Its author was Sir Fairfax L. Cartwright, a member of the Diplomatic Service. The book was reprinted in 1925, and it contains two important sources of Sufi experience for those who can understand it. The portion devoted to stories is designed to lift momentarily the veil between ordinary thought and the inner questioning of the mind. The other portion gives a series of inner experiences, which are numbered and which represent one person's varied realisation of the extra element possible to man's attainment before he comes to the point where he can make use of this perception. Like Burton, 
Sir Fairfax found it necessary to attribute in the first edition the authorship to an Oriental, Sheikh Haji Ibrahim of Kabela. He uses the Eastern imagery and setting because it does lend itself to the projection of Sufi thought through the objectivization of the content. Like the fable with which this book begins, it enables the reader to detach himself from associations and to participate to some extent in the reality which the author is trying to convey. The reader does not really think of himself as a dervish or oriental king. To this extent, he can safely entertain ideas in theory and even more that he would reject if they were presented within his own culture pattern. This book is no substitute for Sufi experience, but it contains material well suited to the Western mind trying to grasp a mode of thought which in its culture lacks many agreed bases. The idea that ecstatic experience is Sufism or really mysticism of any kind is one of the numerous points scotched by Cartwright. The man who is despondent seeks consolation in intoxication, but intoxication may be produced by good wine or by bad wine. The good wine will raise him into a state of material ecstasy and make him forget his despondency. The bad wine will make his state worse than it was before. So it is with the spiritual wine. If it be pure, it will lift the disciple who drinks thereof into the realm of the perfect contemplation of the truth. But if it be adulterated and impure, it will throw his soul back even further than the point which it has already attained. The allegory of alchemy, a traditional Sufi tale in which the great work of transmutation is accomplished, is given a fresh form in the book. The book is full of allegories, and one of the best is a Western adaptation of The Tale of the Sands, which loses nothing in the form which he gives it. A bubbling stream reached a desert and found that it could not cross it. The water was disappearing into the fine sand faster and faster. The stream said aloud, My destiny is to cross this desert, but I can see no way. This is the situation of the disciple who needs a master, but who cannot trust one, the pathetic human situation. The voice of the desert answered, in the hidden tongue of nature, saying, The wind crosses the desert, and so can you. But whenever I try, I am absorbed into the sand, and even if I dash myself at the desert, I can only go a little distance. The wind does not dash itself against the desert sand. But the wind can fly, and I cannot. You are thinking in the wrong way. Trying to fly by yourself is absurd. Allow the wind to carry you over the sand. But how can that happen? Allow yourself to be absorbed in the wind. The stream protested that it did not want to lose its individuality in that way. If it did, it might not exist again. This, said the sand, was a form of logic, but it did not refer to reality at all. When the wind absorbed moisture, it carried it over the desert and then let it fall again like rain. The rain again became a river. But how, asked the stream, could it know that this was true? It is so and you must believe it, or you will simply be sucked down by the sands to form, after several million years, a quagmire. But if that is so, will I be the same river that I am today? You cannot in any case remain the same stream that you are today. The choice is not open to you, it only seems to be open. The wind will carry your essence the finer part of you. When you become a river again at the mountains beyond the sands, men may call you by a different name, but you yourself essentially will know that you are the same. Today you call yourself such and such a river only because you do not know which part of it is even now your essence. So the stream crossed the desert by raising itself into the arms of the welcoming wind, 
which gathered it slowly and carefully upward, and then let it down with gentle firmness, atop the mountains of a far-off land. Now, said the stream, I have learnt my true identity. But it had a question, which had bubbled up as it sped along. Why could I not reason this out on my own? Why did the sands have to tell me? What would have happened if I had not listened to the sands? Suddenly a small voice spoke to the stream. It came from a grain of sand. Only the sands know, for they have seen it happen. Moreover, they extend from the river to the mountain. They form the link, and they have their function to perform, as has everything. The way in which the stream of life is to carry itself on its journey is written in the sands. This podcast is copyright 2016, the Idrisha Foundation.